Welcome to another podcast on Nutriscience Labs. Uh, we have myself, Vice President of Sales, Blaney McEnany, along with Gene Bruno, Senior Director of Product Innovation at Nutriscience, also the Professor of Nutraceutical Science at Huntington University of Health Sciences. Welcome, Gene. Uh, good to be back, Blaney. Glad I, to have I, you. I'm, I'm excited about our conversation today because it's something that has been uh, sort of a big thorn in my side when you hear people say that there's no FDA regulation of dietary supplements. So, I like the fact that uh, today we're going to talk about what the FDA regulation of dietary supplements is, uh, some misconceptions about that, and, you know, like the role that uh, Nutrisize Labs uh, can play in this whole process. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, it's one of those things that comes up a lot. There's plenty of myths to dispel, but also with the FDA in general, uh, I think there's a lot that people are intimidated about with getting into the industry and starting a supplement so we can help them out there as well and make sure that they understand the risks associated with creating a dietary supplement and how that affects their brand in association with the FDA. Yeah, now that makes sense. Um, you know, there are a, a number of different laws and regulations, but I would say that the main one that that brand owners need to be concerned with is the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994. That's kind of the meat and potatoes of all the regulations, covers GMPs, covers the kind of claims that you can make, covers um, the, the kind of labeling that has to be done. It's really uh, everything that you need to know about. You know, there's also the Food uh, Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act, but that's just about what major allergens have to be listed on, on the product. But really, uh, the uh, DSHEA, Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, DSHEA, is the main biggie. And, and one of the things that um, people need to know is it's not a, just a static situation. It, it kind of gets updated a little bit. Uh, in, in the case of um, uh, some of the labeling guidelines, those have changed. Uh, in, in 2016, and not only were there some new daily values, but the way certain nutrients are measured changed. So vitamin E, vitamin D, um, uh, the, and, and, and in vitamin, let's see, vitamin A, D, and E were actually previously measured in international units or IUs. Now it's changed. They're measured in either uh, micrograms or milligrams. So uh, if you're a brand owner and if you already had products that had that, as of uh, January of 2020 was the deadline, you're supposed to have changed it to the new way of measurement. And if you haven't, you better, you know, get on the stick and do that pretty quick. Um, but um, those are just one of the sets of changes. And then and even things like, hey, choline, which didn't used to be a, a nutrient with a daily value, now it is. And there's a, a few other things like that that they need to be aware of. Um, and so, you know, you can actually, uh, in, the, in the comments section uh, of, of, this, of this podcast, there's a, you know, a, a link there to a blog that will give you a little more information about that. And then I would just mentioned regarding the uh, the regulations on allergen listing, there's, you know, eight, uh, milk, egg, peanuts, tree nuts, um, soy, wheat, fish, and crustacean shellfish. If you have those in there, you got to mention it. Otherwise, that's, um, that's the only part of that, that allergen law you need to be concerned with. For me, I think one of the big areas of the shade that, that, that's just so important is about claims and structure function claims are your main ones. They're not your only ones, okay? But they are your main ones. So if you're gonna talk about um, uh, a, a given benefit that a product has, you normally couch it in structure function language. For example, you, you wouldn't, you might wanna say glucosamine helps reduce joint pain, but you can't say that because that's a drug claim. Okay. What you can say is glucosamine helps promote joint comfort. Okay. And, and so you have to understand the ins and outs of how to uh, craft your claims. And um, certainly that's something that, you know, getting a good regulatory lawyer or a regulatory consultant. And, uh, you know, I, I imagine that even uh, Nutriscience Labs will have some commentary on that for their, their brand owners. Um, yeah, and I, and I didn't I didn't necessarily want to cut you off in the middle of speaking with that, but that's actually something that we help with with new brands, existing brands when they're com coming out with a new product and creating something. Um, it's one of the biggest challenges with the label that um, that you deal with is that um, every brand wants to make some claim, 
whether it's a light claim or an aggressive claim, they want to get their point across to their audience of what the product is meant to do. And it is a challenge, but we have the departments in house where uh, we may not always help with what the claim should be. Uh, we do do that. I know that you have helped with in the past with certain formulations um, and white papers that back up those claims. But for the, for the majority of those situations, we can help our, our existing brands and new brands understand the risk associated with what those claims are so that the education process is going on during the label process so that we have an understanding when the product is made and a comfort level that when you bring the product to market, you're not just sending out this blind product and just hoping that you don't get in trouble for what you said. Uh, you understand the risk associated with what you said and uh, the responsibility associated with what your claims may be as well. Yeah, very good points. And I would say there's, there's two major considerations when putting together structure function claims. One is, is it a legal claim? Is it an actual structure function claim you're making? Or is it a drug claim? That's one. And then the second consideration is, is it true? And right. is it true has to do with, do you have documentation that says, yeah, um, I can demonstrate that the claim I'm making is true. So for example, if you have a, um, uh, if you're making a claim about vitamin C and how it is going to help impact the immune system in some positive way, and let's say you have 500 milligrams of vitamin C and you're making a specific claim about that, um, you know, there's a couple of good studies showing that 500 milligrams of vitamin C will have this positive impact on your immune system. Um, but if you put in, uh, you know, five milligrams of, of vitamin C, you're not necessarily going to be able to make that same claim. So you have to make sure you have the data to support it. So it's not just, is it legal? It's also, is it true? And can you prove that it's true? Those are the two things. You know, other claims, there's another kind of claim called a health claim. And it's very different than a structure function claim. It's a claim that the FDA has said, here's the exact wording of what can be used. And there's very, very few that apply to dietary supplements. More of them um, are really associated with, with foods. And they're really associated with a different law called the Nutrition Labeling and Education Act, which preceded Deche. But it gives you some specific ones, like there's ones about like folic acid helping to prevent neural tube defects in pregnancy, a few things like that, that that can be used. Uh, and then there's even uh, what's called qualified health claims, which are things like, you know, uh, um, certain omega-3 fatty acids can help reduce, uh, uh, you know, hyper, the risk of hypertension and coronary heart disease, but they're qualified. So it says, it, so it, after that, it might have another statement that says, um, you know, but the FDA has determined that there's insufficient evidence uh, to support this claim. They'll allow it, but then you have to give that qualification. So most of the time people aren't using qualified health claims. Sometimes they use uh, health claims, but it's very rare. Again, the structure function claims are the main ones and that's what's important. And understanding, and people sometimes just don't understand that the claim they wanna make is a drug claim. Uh, and so, so really getting some guidance in that regard is very helpful. And I know that's one of the things where Nutriscience Labs can do a good job to say, Hey guys, you may not be aware of this, but mm -hmm. the kind of claim you want to make is, is somewhat problematic. And that is exceptionally good advice to be able to get from a, a contract manufacturer that you uh, may not always get. Yeah, and um, I, I want to back up a little bit uh, when we were talking about the Deche Act and uh, referring to one major point, I don't know if we touched on it enough, about how the ingredients that were grandfathered in prior to 1994 oh, yes. are two ingredients that are uh, currently being used. I think with the industry that we're in, um, so so much marketing, so much advertising and product out there is always about the next big thing, the next new thing, which really is a challenge because there should be some uh, parameters that need to be followed about what's being used. And for what I felt to be the longest time over the last 15 years being in the industry is that there was, uh, it seemed to be that there was some gray area or maybe just a lack of enforcement on certain ingredients that were being sold as dietary ingredients. Um, and no one seemed to really realize or know that they weren't technically considered dietary ingredients because no one had either gotten an NDI or a grass certification that you were referring to uh, when we previously spoke about that. So maybe you could weigh in a little bit more about that. Yeah, that, that excellent point. Um, so let's just address dietary ingredients um, first. So in the Shea, it defines dietary ingredients as essentially some ingredient that you may have gotten 
from your diet, whether it's eating certain foods, certain herbs, certain other things. So it's the ingredients and some of the metabolites that they may uh, create are dietary ingredients. So that can mean vitamins, minerals, herbs, all kinds of different things. But here's the deal. It's not enough to be a dietary ingredient because you consume it. It's also a function of um, whether the FDA has says, yes, this is safe to have, okay? And so there's three ways, three ways to determine uh, a dietary ingredient. One is to have an NDI number. An NDI is new dietary ingredient. And that is um, you submit an application to the FDA saying, here's the ingredient, and you're basically demonstrating why it's safe for use. It's really not about efficacy, it's about safety. And so if that goes through and that's approved, then it, you have an NDI on that ingredient and it can be used in dietary supplements. Right? The second way is it could be an ODI, an old dietary ingredient, which means that prior to October of 1994, it was in commerce, meaning it was used already in uh, foods or supplements, okay? And you can prove that. You have to be able to prove that it was used in it. Sometimes it's um, things like old advertisements, things that showed it was for sale. There's different ways to prove it, but it has to be either an NDI or an ODI in order to be allowed in dietary supplements. Or the third way, um, is it could be, it could have grass status, G-R-A-S generally regarded as safe. Um, and so there's a lot of ingredients that are grass that are used as excipients or additives or other things. And, and, and to be clear, that's grass for, for ingestion, not grass for use on the skin or as a cosmetic ingredient. So, uh, and, and many times uh, organizations, companies, groups will submit uh, a, a grass application to the FDA uh, for um, a ingredient. There's some that also do self-affirmed grass, which is not quite as strong, um, but that can be done as well. But in any case, there's a number of ingredients that have come out over the years where it doesn't have any of those and they just come out on the market with it. And eventually the FDA catches up and goes, uh, no, can't have that. There's no approval for that. Right. And, and I'm glad, glad you brought that up because one of the things I think that that leads to one of the most common misconceptions is that the FDA or the dietary supplement industry is not regulated by the FDA because you can find those products that slip through the cracks and they're selling products with ingredients that are not dietary ingredients. Um, for instance, you know, we get a lot of requests for cognitive enhancement formulas and many of these emerging brands that may not even establish the brand yet are looking for products with ingredients that are not dietary ingredients like yeah. pept, um, or, um, you know, not so much Vinpositin anymore, but, uh, Vinpositin was one as well. And, uh, Paracetam and all of the, the TAMs we used to call them, Anaracetam, all these, uh, ingredients that were really drugs that were being sold as dietary ingredients, which I, you could see how they can give the industry a bad name. Uh, and they can also lead that misconception that if you're able to sell products that have ingredients in them, if they're out there being sold, well, then the industry must not be being regulated if that's out there. Yeah. And so that's a good point. And um, so let me address that whole myth that, um, the, uh, you know, the, the dietary supplement industry is not regulated by the FDA. It, of course, is heavily regulated by the FDA. There's 10 different laws and groups of regulations surrounding dietary supplements and how they're to be sold and so forth. Um, now, does that mean everybody always follows the rules? No, everybody doesn't always follow the rules. In pharmaceuticals, they don't always follow the rules, but they do more often than not. Um, and in the case of pharmaceuticals, a new pharmaceutical comes on the market and it actually has to be approved by the FDA. The fact is, there is no mechanism by which any dietary supplement, any dietary supplement is approved by the FDA. There's no process whereby you submit your dietary supplement and they go, yes, I approve this. There is none. So to say we have an approved dietary supplement or our diet or that dietary supplement's not approved, well, there is no approval process. Right. So it's it's a it's a red herring, is what that is. Um, now that there's still plenty of laws and regulations. 
Does the FDA always have all the manpower it needs to properly police everything? Not always, okay? But companies that are, are legitimate companies that are doing things right, are following the rules, following the regulations, unfortunately, there's some out there who are not always following it. But to be clear, FDA um, is, is heavily involved in the regulation of dietary supplements. Oftentimes, the squeakiest wheel gets the oil, meaning those companies that are doing the most egregious things, the most, the greatest errors, the greatest problems, mm -hmm. are the ones that end up uh, waving the red flags that get the FDA saying, or writing you a letter, cease and desist, and you know, you're in violation of this, that, or the other thing. Um, and so that's something to consider. And while I'm at it, <laughs> there, there's one other uh, error that I have seen a few companies make. Um, once in a while, you'll see on their website or God forbid on their label where they'll say something, they'll have like the FDA logo that appears on their product or on their website. And the FDA does not like that. You may not use the FDA's logo in any way, shape or form. I was telling you the other day a story about a um, company I used to work for years ago who uh, did, did manufacturing and their labs, their, their, their manufacturing facility was actually um, uh, pharmaceutically registered by the FDA, meaning, meaning they could make pharmaceuticals. And um, so they would have on some of the posters um, for the dietary supplements, not on the labels, hey, made at an FDA uh, pharmaceutically registered manufacturing facility, which was a true statement. But the FDA said, nope, take it off. You can't, even though it was true, uh, and most of the time it, there, it's not true when you have anything associated with the FDA listed on a label or, or on, a, on a website for supplements. But in any case, don't make that mistake. You, you don't want to make an enemy of the FDA, and there's no quicker way of doing it than starting to slap their logo all over or, your, or their name all over your, your, uh, your products or your, your websites. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of this... Um... It comes from, you would start with maybe even the general public that's taking supplements, many of which really have no insight and knowledge into the industry whatsoever. Um, they, the public is, is certainly a common misconception about the FDA and does it regulate the industry. But then there's others on the other side where um, when you see brands or manufacturers that are utilizing that FDA logo, um, it can be a misconception now that that product is somehow associated with the FDA, which is one of the reasons why you don't want that on the packaging is because the consumer cannot tell the difference. If you put an FDA logo where it said register or manufactured in the FDA registered facility and you use the FDA logo on that packaging, well, the consumer is going to associate that with the safe product, which may in turn actually be um, the opposite because it's such an irresponsible thing to do as a brand to put that on there to really manipulate the, the consumer that's taking the product. Or, or, the, or the consumer may think, oh, FDA, this has been approved by the FDA. Right. Exactly. When in fact, there's no mechanism by which a product is approved. Now, my having just said that, let me make one thing clear. There is a process by which brands can submit their structure function claims about a product to the FDA. And that's generally done uh, typically 90 days before introduction to market. You submit your claims. The FDA does not approve those claims. They just have a, they just don't object. After 90 days, if there's no objection, then you get, then you get what's called a no objection. <laughs> and right. as a result of no objection, you can proceed with making those claims about your product, those structure function claims. And obviously you want to make darn sure that when you submit them to the FDA, everything is buttoned up. You have, they are not drug claims. They are clear structure function claims and you have support for them. The FDA is not necessarily going to ask for that. But if they do, you better be ready. Right. So um, that's the only thing about supplements that you really submit to the uh, to the FDA. Um, you know, one thing we hadn't covered yet, and I just think it's worth mentioning, as long as we're talking about myths, is the um, the myth that all Chinese raw materials are bad, or right? any raw materials. Yeah. In China. It's now, certainly been a hot topic of of late. You know, just due to the current world climate, we get a lot of requests where people call in and ask that their products are not manufactured with Chinese derived raw materials. Yeah. So here's the deal. Um, I will say that I've been around in this industry long enough uh, 
that I remember when materials first started coming from China. And some of them were definitely of questionable quality. But a lot has changed over the decades. And while there are still some supplements, uh, some raw materials that come from China that aren't good, the same can be said for some raw materials that come from the US that are of questionable quality. The real question now isn't so much where did it come from? It's when you got it, did you test it? So as you well know, as a contract manufacturer, a raw material comes in, it goes into quarantine. Right. Then it goes into the lab and you test it. You look at heavy metals, you look at microbiological things like E. coli, salmonella, and you do, all, do this full range of testing. Plus you test to see if, um, you know, for identity, is it what it says it is? you know, in its potency, you do all this testing. Once it's passed all those tests, then and only then is it released into the population of raw materials that are then ready for use in a dietary supplement. So whether it comes from the US, Canada, Europe, or China, that's the kind of testing that needs to be done. And I'm, I'm um, here to tell people who don't know otherwise, that if you say, I don't want any Chinese raw materials to be used in my, my products, you're going to have, um, a lot less options because nowadays, a huge, huge number of them. When I say the majority, mm, pretty. Let me just say a really significant amount of raw materials do come from China, and they've cleaned up their act so much, and it's so much better. But as again, that's why it's important, folks, to work with a contract manufacturer for your brand that does it right, because a good contract manufacturer like Nutriscience Labs, is going to make sure everything is tested and pass those tests before it's used in the product. No matter and also, Yeah, and there's also a qualification process that goes along with that as well, where um, you don't blindly take a raw material supplier and then just taste, test their, their product. You go through the actual quality process of yeah. qualifying them and then making sure that they pass the qualification process, but then continually test and make sure that the product is what it says it is in the tree of contaminants. Uh, and it's one of the challenges that we deal with where um, not very often, but sometimes brands would like to supply their own raw material. Um, that's kind of a tough issue to deal with because one, you might think that that actually speeds the process up, but it actually can significantly slow it down and add risk. We actually prefer to take as much liability as possible and provide as many components as possible. So you don't run into a situation where if a customer supplied a material, that material shows up, that supplier drop ships it to our location. All the paperwork says 100 kilos. You make the product and you only had 80 kilos worth of finished product to be able to be made. Well, now you're in a, a quarrel between the raw material supplier, your customer, who's right, what happened. Let us take that responsibility. We don't want to be in a situation where now you're in a, a, an uncomfortable situation that could have been avoided. We would rather qualify that raw material supplier and buy it directly. Uh, it's just a cleaner process and um, it just avoids any of the unnecessary risk or, um, you know, issue. That yeah, it, 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 yeah I, I agree. Um, it makes so much more sense uh, just to let Nutrisize Labs take on that responsibility because they've been doing it for many, many years and know how to do it correctly and make sure all the T's are crossed, all the I's are dotted and everything is as it should be. Um, I'd like to also just take a quick moment to mention, I don't want to go into details about it because you could do a whole show on it, but that a lot of times um, there are some certifications that are of interest to brand owners. Um, things like, you know, kosher or halal or non-GMO or mm -hmm. organic or vegan certified or GMP certified or NSF for sport goes on and on. Any and all of these can be possible, uh, but just know that it comes with its own set of challenges and limitations. If you want to do organic, well, you know, there's different ways to do it. But if you want to have that organic logo on the front of your label, you have to have either 100% or 95% of the materials organic. And then anything that's not organic, it has to be an approved list included with non-organic. It has to be manufactured in a way consistent with the processes that are considered organic. So there's a lot involved there and your limitations right. are much greater. You don't have as much raw material to choose from. Similarly, you have a situation like that with non-GMO if you want to be uh, non-GMO certified. Uh, some non-GMO processes uh, for certification are easier than others, but a lot can be involved in it. And, uh, you know, any of these are possible, and you can certainly discuss that with Future Science Labs. It just depends on your market and what you're trying to achieve. 
And there are challenges around that, especially like you've mentioned certified organic. It, it's not necessarily an overwhelming challenge from a manufacturing standpoint, but if you're a new brand and you want to break into the organic market, you are starting off with a higher minimum order. You're starting off with a longer lead time. You're involving a agency in, in the actual manufacturing process. So you're adding an extra step, you're adding a layer of complexity, and when you're doing something for the first time, it doesn't make it easier. Um, we can, of course, help along with that process, but some of the things that we recommend where if, um, if organic is the ultimate goal, start by using organic ingredients, but don't make the claims. You don't necessarily have to come out and say made with organic or certified organic. Use organic ingredients, focus on selling a high quality product, and then as you gain sales and gain momentum, you can go through the organic process while you're actually selling inventory so that you're not at the mercy of that long a, time and that high expense as a startup. That's a very, very good recommendation because you, as you said, you can use organic materials in your product and you can list that in the supplement packs box right. without having to jump through all of the regulatory hoops. The moment you start wanting to list something on a different part of the, the label, especially the front, that changes the nature of the beast. Yeah. Um, so one of the other ones that you mentioned in there as well was uh, was maybe gluten-free allergens. Ah, um, uh, yeah. So so um, what should be known is that uh, you know gluten-free is a sort of a popular thing. There are a group of um, individuals who have celiac sprue disease, who it's not just a popularity issue; it's a, a vital health concern, where they have a, a very uh, severe reaction if they consume gluten. And consequently, to make the term gluten-free, it's not the same thing as saying, well, dairy-free. Well, you might have, let's say you had lactose intolerance, there's a small, some amount of lactose in there. Uh, you know, generally the worst that you're gonna experience is you might get a little diarrhea or something. With gluten, you could have severe reactions that could put you in the hospital if you're a celiac expert. But because gluten-free uh, became a popular thing for a lot of people who didn't have celiac brew, it's now something that's much more common. Um, and to get it, it's, it's actually a relatively simple test. It's testing the finished product. It's looking at how many parts per million you have. And generally, depending on the test that you're doing, it's either less than 15 or less than 20 parts per million gluten, uh, allowing it to be labeled as gluten-free. So it's a relatively simple test, but you can't just say gluten-free because you go, well, I don't have any ingredients in here that contain gluten. No because just in case there's any cross-contamination uh, in one batch or another batch or something that was done or so, something that might've happened, you have to do the test if you want to say gluten-free. On every lot as well. Every yeah. single lot of every single product. That's right, yeah. you're doing that with. You can't and do and again, product. you know, a lot of those allergen uh, requests, you know, they do create challenges for, uh, for startup brands. It's something we get a lot of requests for. And, I think the comparison that many of these brands are making is that, well, there's these well-established brands that are making these claims. Um, but when you look at the scale, if you're starting off with a, with a small order of 1500 bottles and you're going to be performing allergen testing and going through the amount of time it takes waiting for the allergen results and making sure that the product passes and is cleared, the expense and the time, the percentage of that order of that expense is a lot higher for a new brand getting in if they're spending the money on all of this testing for 1500 bottles, where if you're comparing it to a major brand out there that's been in the industry for 30, 40 oh, yeah. years, that's running maybe 100,000 bottles at a time, that's a fraction of the cost of their actual production run versus a new brand that's trying to get into the industry. And I think that's something that we should all understand uh, whether or not it is 100% essential to do that on the front end of starting a product, or maybe, make a product, test the finished product, and then have an understanding of maybe where your risk is as you move forward with your future orders so that you have an understanding of what your product can possibly pass in the future. So there's kind of a little reoccurring theme I hear from you, Blaney, and I tend to agree with it. If you're brand new and you're small, it, it, uh, sort of better not to jump into your business with too many visions of grandeur right out, right, right at, at the beginning. Say, yeah. these are goals I want to get to. I want to get to organic or uh, certified, or I want to get to uh, gluten-free certified mm -hmm. and so forth and so forth and so on. 
but maybe not start there immediately. Build it, do it, and then as you get more money in and you can afford to do more things and the process is cleaner and it moves through more quickly, then is a better time to consider doing some of these things. Absolutely. And, and like you were mentioning before, when we talk about how does this incorporate with the FDA, I think the allergen conversation is, is further than the FDA because we make comparisons where if you're making health claims. There's a lot of health claims out there that may not be true, but aren't necessarily harmful. Allergen claims have to be taken very seriously. And I've seen many brands that maybe they were a small brand, they were having their product made somewhere else, and now they come to us and they say, well, I want it soy-free, dairy-free, gluten-free, non-GMO. They list every single allergen and claim you can think of in terms of from the allergen spectrum. And I say, all right, where are the test results from your prior manufacturer? Oh, we don't have them. So if you don't have them, you have to assume that they weren't done. And if that hasn't been, been done, you could be in a situation where you're putting a product in the market, not knowingly, that could be dangerous to someone's health if they have a high allergic, allergic reaction um, to any of those major allergens. That's right. I mean, so um, it's one thing to say that it's something is made without an allergen. It's another one to say it's free of it. Because again, cross-contamination is always a possibility and a risk. And so to say free of, you know, you, that, that's, a, that's a much greater um, risk if you're going to do that than to say, you know, made without any of these things. And so it's, it's really important to do it and do it correctly. And, and if in doubt, don't make the claim because you'll get yourself in trouble if you do. And you can't prove it. Something happens. Well, absolutely. Um, you know, other than that, Gene, do you have any other t uh, topics of discussion that you wanted to cover from, from an FDA standpoint? No, I think not so much from an FDA standpoint. One of the things I would just want to say to the viewers is if you, um, if you, if you liked the topic today, you want to uh, subscribe to our, our, our YouTube channel, uh, you like it, share it with others if you, if you thought it was, was worthwhile. We would appreciate that. Absolutely. And feel free to make comments about any future topics that you'd like to know more about. We'd love to talk in discussions about how we can help uh, educate small brands out there consumers, whoever it may be, that would like to know more about the industry, the manufacturing process, and see where we can help. Yeah, and peruse the website, because um, not only do we have other podcasts, but we've got a, a whole, all kinds of blogs and articles that are really meant to educate brand owners about a broad range of topics associated with being a brand owner and what you need to know. Uh, and so uh, I think you'll find it really helpful. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time again, Gene. It's always a pleasure. I look forward to the next Likewise. All right, take care. Take care.